Hello, and welcome to the 40s Formula, your go-to place for insightful discussions on navigating your 40s and thriving in this transformative decade. We're your hosts, Amanda and Jasmine, two women that are passionate about exploring the challenges and adventures that come with turning 40 and what lies ahead. Our guest today is Dr. Cheryl Kamm, functional medicine doctor, burnout recovery coach, and founder of the Vibrant Life Academy. Cheryl empowers smart moms and coaches with the knowledge and nutritional wisdom to create thriving families, teams, and societies. With 15 years of clinical experience, she provides the skills and mentorship to transform your health deeply. Cheryl studied at the highest level, obtaining an Integrative and Functional Medicine Fellowship through the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine. She also holds a certification in Advanced Nutrient Therapy and Brain Biochemistry by the Walsh Research Institute in Chicago, USA. Dr. Cheryl is also a homeschooling mom to four kids, and she still makes time for self-care, reflection, and balance. Cheryl, we are so excited to have you here today, not just as a medical professional, though I'm very excited that you're here as a medical professional, but also as a fellow coach and also as a fellow geriatric mama, because we got to stick together. Oh, okay, geriatric mama, <laughs> yeah. thanks. That's yeah. the first time yeah. I got called that, but yeah. you know what? Truth you, is truth. You might have been called it on paper somewhere. Uh-huh. You know, like that's the first time I noticed being called that. But okay. I love that your approach is all about vibrancy. I feel like this is a term that we don't get enough of in our 40s, right? About feeling vibrant. There's so much chatter about, you know, how we're on the decline or how our hormones are dropping and how everything. But this actually can be a vibrant chapter of our lives. Can you talk to me about how you help women achieve vibrancy? Thank you for asking that because I meet so many women who are just happy surviving. How many times do we have these conversations? Like, oh, how are you doing? Oh, same old coping, surviving. And I'm like, hey, what happened? You know, what happened to all of us and all of our fire growing up? And I tap into my childhood a lot because I've got children now and I happen to, you know, this, this kind of phase in your life makes you look at your own childhood. Yeah. And go, what happened to that fire? Surely, you know, and I do feel it strongly. I started on this path a lot before I hit 40, which is this year. Mm. Um, So definitely that's my fire. And then seeing the contrast of how people have gone into their 30s or more mid 30s to 40 that I'm meeting women beginning to talk that way. And I was like, what the heck? No, like this is not what we're here for, you know. Um, But of course it started, this whole journey started and and me interfacing with moms and women and and even menopausing and postmenopausal women as well. Um, This whole phase definitely started with my own personal journey a lot earlier than than this time now where I just hit hit 40. Yeah. And can you tell us about that? Because I noticed that, you know, one of kind of your unique titles is a burnout recovery coach. And you mentioned that you had an experience with burnout yourself. When did that happen for you? Absolutely. And always learning, definitely. Mm. Um, Well, in my life as a, even at even before medical school, even as a teen, it was kind of like in a rush rush. And, Mm. you know, I grew up in a place like Singapore, which I don't know if you know for those listening, it's very um, big on achievement and big on um, qualifications and titles and um, basically achievement, right? So... um, my parents bought into that. My mom bought into that. They were separated. So my mom bought into that and said, you know, listen, like if anything I could give them is the best opportunity in education. And after that, she can go figure stuff out herself, you know, and she made the choices that she made. But there was pressure. I was in, you know, not so much the top school. And then I ran um, ran well. So I was in track and field and then got like kind of, you know, um, invited to the top school, but then felt all the pressure as well, like pressure to run well, also pressure to study well and score well and everything. But I learned the game. I survived it, but I also learned how to like, you know, pass exams and whatnot. And that gave me some good skills. And then, you know, went, got myself into medical school and then, and did all the things. But, you know, you can imagine what this go, go, go mentality can do to you. Right. 
I can only imagine because, you know, mm-hmm. the American school system is very different. I mean, not to say that there's not an achievement culture, and I think it's intensifying, you know, now. But, you know, we don't have the school competition that you guys have, meaning where it's like you have to get into a top school at a very mm-hmm. young age. That oh, that pressure comes yeah. on when you are so unprepared for it, I feel, you know, observing that from an, as an outsider. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, I haven't found that sweet spot with it. And so my children are not enrolled in schools at the moment until I until I find my sweet spot. How with old it. are your kiddos? I know you have they, four, which makes you, again, official super mom. Yeah. I mean, oh, my gosh. I, like, <laughs> push them out. Um, we we really, I got married um, late-ish, so 30 plus. And, you know, we did want lots and lots of kids around us. So it was literally like, if you want a lot of big family, you got to push them out, mm-hmm. you know? Start and now. So, <laughs> yeah, correct. So we started straight away right. and um, had kids every two years. And so they are currently... Um, Six, four, two, and seven wow. months. That oh. is a full house. It's a full house. <laughs> it's I all very it. cute. And it, it's really cute. Your Instagram is so cute. <laughs> they're all so innocent. Yeah. And, you know, there are these things that they say, and I'm like, oh, my God, I, keep, I wish I could capture them. But then I'm not being present. And yeah. so, so yeah, they're all there, yeah. like, um, <laughs> you know, swimming around in my head. And then they'll say some more different cute stuff and innocent stuff and it just makes us laugh and it's really joyful if I let it be and you you know sitting before us today right you have a great energy you know you're here you're present you're awake you know it wasn't like you dragged in the door how do you maintain that yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) okay okay, there's also caffeine on the table there's also food on the table I'm gonna take you on on this latte (laughs) but how do you maintain like feeling vibrant feeling energetic when I think the dominant narrative especially on social media when you have small kids at home home mm-hmm. is you're destroyed, you're sleep deprived, you're struggling, you're barely making it above water. How do yeah. you turn that narrative on its head? I mean, that was what I was told as a pregnant mom with my first. And, I, and you know, Same. you know, yeah. Same. And seasoned moms were coming up to me saying, your life is never going to be the same. And I'm like, what? You know, or you're never going to sleep again. And four hours is amazing. And I cannot do with less than eight hours sleep. Sometimes I need 10, you know, that's me. And I know myself. And so I was like, what am I getting myself into? That gave me a lot of birth fear. Yeah. That was quite harming. Yeah. Um, even though it contains some truth and maybe some good good intention, um, but me being me, I'm like, let me try it out myself mm-hmm. and show them. Not show them, figure it out, yeah. and then see. Yeah. And then I saw something different, and I'm like, now let me show them. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like, hey, that was the first thing that I broke. I'm, like, I'm not someone. So um, I did a few things and it did require work obviously because I tended to be of a type A personality if you kind of still use that term around I tended to push myself a little bit more than I needed to and so the skill of learning how to take care of myself had to kind of retrain from scratch actually yeah Yeah, to the point where I was like okay look listen in this skill I'm an infant yeah and I'm gonna learn it um however what gave me a lot of wind beneath my wings is the fact that I'm a yeah Actually, the doctor thing, I might, I'm a bit like to and fro with, but the fact that after that, I questioned myself and I was like, am I really helping or am I really helping? You know what I mean? Like with doctoring and in the medical industry as we know it, because I really wanted to help. That was it. And I thought a medical degree would help me help. Um, It didn't. And so I continued looking for the answers and I went on to study nutritional medicine and and look at how our environment matters to us today. It really, really does. It's not an individual issue. It's a societal and an environmental issue. If everyone begins to see it that way, they're not going to be as hard on themselves. Um, So I studied that, went on courses, met lots of people, you know, hung out with naturopaths and everything. And then bit by bit got myself weller with nutrients, with herbs, with understanding my hormones, with implementing my, this diet that I prescribed to other people but never practiced myself. And now I'm like, hang on, I need to kind of, you know, walk the talk yeah. now. What sort of things should women who are in their 40s look out for when they are getting to that sort of burnout stage or even prior to getting to that point yeah. where they're like, what are the fuck? <laughs> what's burnout going red on? flags? Mm. You know, like what, what should they be sort of focusing on? Like, how, yeah, what are the red flags, like you say? 
Absolutely. I mean, there are six stages of burnout if you kind of quickly oh, wow. go Google it. And being able to identify yourself at stage one before things go to stage six, where you're behaving a little bit more like a chronic fatigue person with absolutely a whole host of mood issues and definitely a whole list of diagnosis by that point, endometriosis, PCOS, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, heart disease, kidney disease, that extreme end of stuff, right? You know, where recovery is not just a two-week adaptogen uh, drink, right? right? Um, That's stage six, okay? And and stage five is some level of that where actually there is some kind of recovery and maybe the recovery can take you six months to a year. Stage six, it's like there I've still got clients in their two, three, four-year journey going slowly, climbing out of that pit. Okay, so six, five, then we've got four where maybe there's one diagnosis and there's that feeling of stress, but someone's still managing to cope, right? Still managing to cope with some drugs, with some crutches, with the best supplements, but they're taking it every single day and they can't do a day without, yeah. right? With your uh, Are these ashwagandha. drugs wine? Or- <laughs> 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 well, Is this a <laughs> or you really mean drug now? <laughs> yeah, you know... Um, I mean, okay, we live in the bubble in Singapore. Most people are kind of okay, but there are people using drugs to numb things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're using alcohol to numb things. That's for sure. But my predominant population are living in Singapore, and and there's less of this drug thing here, right? You know, um, and alcoholism is not as rife. But surely the rest of the world, there's that. Um, glass of wine every night that turns into two glasses of wine every night or like oh my god it's like every single night now and if I don't have it it's uh, it's uh, yeah I can't mm-hmm. mm, yeah you see so where were we S- stage six five four getting less in severity three um it's some measure of it. All of it is a little bit of a spectrum. So I think off the top of my head, I couldn't really kind of shout it out to you. But two and three are more or less where a lot of people walking around in the professional world, right, going to work every day, running their families, flick between. Yeah. They just flick in between stage two and three all the time. Some days you're okay. Some days you're not okay. Um, some days you're coping and some days you're not coping. But then in general, how you would report to your friends is like, I'm doing well. Like you're actually motivated. Oh, like I, and then I had, you know, I went on a 20 day diet and now I feel great. And then you feel okay again. And then you get into this state of despair and it's short lived. And then you find some other thing. Like I read this book and it really changed my life. And then you keep going. You just keep going with these little stopgap measures. Yeah. But then some people make it out and some people kind of still continue declining because they haven't looked at the right things. And by that point, the right things are going to be the key nutrients. They're going to be your hormonal health. They're going to be, you know, feeding yourself so your thyroid functions properly and all these basics. Yeah. And looking at, you know, emotional health, which is a big root of why a lot of us and so many more and more and more people are being driven in driving themselves to burnout. Yeah. And that's what I used to do as well. I had the world's programming in my head, talking to myself that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How did you deprogram? I'm still doing it, so I couldn't teach that. (laughs) I couldn't teach that because, like, you know, uh, I'm 40, but I feel one years old in that aspect, really. But, yeah, Yeah. yeah, coaching kind of made me really go, okay, we need to look a bit deeper. As a medical professional, seeing patients and helping them with burnout, at first I thought it was a two-week process. Here, you've got burnout. Let me fix you. Two weeks. Just do this and just do that and you'll be fine. Bye-bye. And then a year later, they'd be like, shit, this has happened again. Uh, And then they'll pay me my fees and buy all the stuff and then they'll cut. So revolving door. Did I solve a problem? I don't think so. I just perpetuated it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's another in and out, like another, I was just like, oh, wait a minute, I'm just getting paid for them to flick between stage two and three of burnout, and I'm earning money just for them to do this to and fro thing, I'm not helping. Yeah, like you said, you're kind of opening a door between those two stages, yeah, right? That's they can it. get a little that's better, like, and then come. they fall back to being a little worse, and yeah. a little better, a little worse. A little better, a little worse, right? Yeah. Like, are we really helping there, you know what In I mean? the fitness profession, I think we see something similar as well, yeah. you know? It's like people go super gung-ho in the beginning, you know, they want to do their 30-day challenge and get in the gym three times a week, and then all of a sudden, 
it just you know an injury happens let's mm-hmm. say you know from from too right. you know too much too fast too soon and then it scales them all the way back sometimes even worse than they were before because then mm-hmm. now they haven't exercised in six months because of the injury so yeah. I think what you and I do is probably very similar in that we're kind of we're encouraging an approach that is not glamorous mm-hmm. it is not a 30 day challenge but it's one that has an eye on longevity and Correct. one that has an eye on resilience and that's a word I know you use a lot in your practice yeah, is building I mean, a resilient approach now that I'm kind of big enough making the unsexy stuff sexy, yeah. like sleep Ooh, or that is sexy health. to me. Ooh, <laughs> to me. Talking about language, Cheryl. <laughs> okay. You know, then I was wanting to also say that going back into stage one, let's talk about stage one burnout. Yeah. That's a bit like people kind of don't really know what stage one burnout looks like. It looks like the picture of success, actually. Mm-hmm. I feel that really resonates with me because mm. I'm the eldest child. Mm-hmm. I'm a daughter. I'm, a, I'm Indian. So, mm-hmm. you know, if I ever got a B in something, my mum would be like, who got an A? And I would mention wow. my friend's name. She'd be like, okay, so you need to get an A. So I always felt this pressure, oh, you know. Yeah. And it wasn't that, you know, my mum was not, you know, like – proud of me or what I had achieved but it was like you can do better and then I felt I could do better so you know I had to get into this particular university I had to study this particular course and all of that pressure I felt was always there and I feel like you know I suffered and I didn't realize I was suffering you know I used to get chronic hives as urticaria I've got Hashimoto's Mm -hmm. when it's perimenopause like a 36 so you know there's just so much that I feel came with the pressure of being the eldest child, being Indian. And it's not a particular issue with, you know, the way I was brought up. I think it was just a cultural cultural norm. And a societal norm yeah. that we're here to break, actually. Yeah. I mean, if we want more of that and we want our kids to continue in this cultural norm, then continue as you are. But if you don't want that, then it kind of... We need to break this, no? Yeah. I feel yeah. I feel the pressure there as well. So we're looking at going back to the UK. Mm-hmm. My eldest son is um, probably going to be heading to secondary school there. And now I'm seeing that there's these exams he needs to take. And I'm, you know, other parents back in the UK are already tutoring their kids and pushing them. Like, you're going to have to get into this school. You're going to have to get into that school. And I'm feeling the pressure again. Like, shit, I want my son to be you know, enjoy his time as a child and, you know, be okay. But I also do want him to get into these schools. And now I'm like, ah, what do I do? There is a conflict because we were exactly brought up in these systems, you know. Um, And even the decision to homeschool my children, right, they're being homeschooled by a person, me, who was schooled. Wow. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. So what am I going to do? So am I going to bring you. school into home? Like, that's toxic. Isn't that what I was trying to avoid in the first place? So it really takes a lot of unpicking. And then that commitment to give yourself time and space to do it because you're building a new personality. All right. So burnout. Yeah. It wasn't that two-week ashwagandha <laughs> boost. Yeah. It really is. I've been doing it for 20 years. I mean, if you ask me when I first burned out, 20 years ago. Wow. Wow. Right? And then I'm like, oh, it's the environment. I'll just lighten my load, you know. And now I'm married so we can share our financial burdens and now I work a little bit less. And I burnt out again. And I'm like, this is not like, you know, and then I worked even less and like thinking that that was the solution. And no, burnt out again. I mean, had that not as major as the first one, but had that feelings of apathy or, or, or like, you know, anxiety. And then the questioning came and then that tiredness. And, and for me, like, my bugbear is eczema. So then, oh, eczema interesting. Because that's out. always your kind of first yeah, sign. My first sign. Mm. Yeah, the, the signs of it. You see. So, um, so it's not a two-week process. Think more in the terms of it's a commitment to really unplug from it, and it's going to take like twenty years, kind of a thing. You know, like when you said. Um, the, you know, our parents are putting the pressure onto us. I feel like they have bought into society and culture's depiction of success and then they've placed it on us. 
And so it's a matter of how much we buy into the external and then place it on our kids as well. And then it just continues that way. And then it just generation on generation becomes a more high pressure environment. Until or someone less breaks it. If we decide to choose different. Yeah. yeah. You know, I always, my, my, well, I shouldn't say I always joke, my parents joke, right, that the concept of helicopter parenting kind of came about, you know, when I was growing up. And my parents always joked that they were never helicopter parents, which is very true. My parents are submarine parents. So they just kind of chill under the surface. Every now and then they throw up the periscope and like, everything good? And we're back down. My parents <laughs> were super that. chill. That's really and I, great. And I, that's exactly how my husband and I try to parent. We, You know, mm-hmm. I think it's a cute example, a cute metaphor, but it really is how we do. You know, mm-hmm. we obviously are always there, right? We're always always under the surface. We're a presence, but we're not over them, hovering, looking, judging. We're just underneath observing. And again, every now and then the periscope, if there's mm. you know, a sound from above, if we really think they're killing each other in the bedroom. My, my kids are three and two, right? Mm-hmm. So they're, they're real little. And it's like, you know, I think we're going to continue on that same vein because we don't want to perpetuate the cycle that my husband did grow up in, in Singapore, with the competitive school system, with the pressure at home as soon as you step out of school, mm. you know, with the tuition as soon as you get out of, you know, you, you go from pressureful, you know, the home pressure to the school pressure to the tuition pressure. You close your eyes for a while and it starts again. Mm. And that's for over a decade. And I can't imagine a, a child growing up in that. And that's not how our kids are going to be. Yeah. So I, I share. Mean, we all are doing our bit, right, to try to, you know, check out of it. Um, you know, I've got friends in the school system trying to keep a balance with it as well. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. Yeah, it's a challenge because, you know, that feeling can come um, feel frustrating and tiring, especially when someone else places their goals on you. Right? If it's your own choice from the get go, it's different. It's different. It feels different. You'd go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, perhaps there are parents out there who, from the get go, they're like really into um, and really believe in the school system and the education and all the tuition and getting into the top schools. Or perhaps that's the right thing for their family and their child. Then, then yeah, I think that they're their flow with it is going to be a lot more than the parent who doesn't quite believe in it but feels that they have to. Very, very subtle difference. Yeah, the forced but, participation. Yeah. I think that's where I am, to be honest. <laughs> so yeah, if I, I want to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah, so... What were you we talking about? We went into that because we were talking about what uh, burnout stage zero looks like. Yeah. The picture of success where it's high achievement and there is a lot of motivation. The drive is high. You know, the optimism is high and um, the ability is actually high. So that type of personality, you know, um, requires that understanding that how, how to take care of yourself, how to, you know, again, align with yourself because you can be very successful achieving other people's goals and then you get to the state of disillusionment um, very, very quickly. Yeah. So to always align back with yourself. Yeah. You mentioned ashwagandha, which I love. Mm. Are there any other types of adaptogens or supplements that women can start taking to just give them that little bit of an edge to help them feel better rather than, the, I guess, the glass of wine in the evening. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I love you asked that question because herbs are a nice extra to have when your body is already functioning. It's just like with plants and fertilizers, right? Your question to me was like asking, oh, what fertilizers are great? My question back, are you giving the plant soil? Mm-hmm. Hey, Amanda. What's more challenging than finding good quality, nutritious food for your family? Probably juggling life in your 40s. Okay, yes, you're right there. But do you know how you can make it a whole lot easier? The Meat Club. The Meat Club is your premier online source for top quality Australian and New Zealand produce here in Singapore. I love their subscription model. It's an easy way to get high quality protein delivered direct to my door. It's packed at the source and delivered via an unbroken cold chain. So no middlemen and more savings in really good quality meat. And guess what? We've got a special treat for our listeners. As a first-time customer of The Meat Club, you can save yourself $12 with no minimum spend. Just use code TFF12 on their website. That's www.themeatclub.com.sg. And don't forget to give them a follow on Instagram at The Meat Club SG. That's T-H-E-M-E-A-T-C-L-U-B-S-G for recipes, updates, and great offers. Now back to the show. Right? Are you giving the plant soil and the basic nutrients? Because one in three 
And actually in the women that ask for me for help, half of them or more than half of them have a nutrient deficiency. And these are basic nutrients. This is iron. You know, this is um, folate, right? This is vitamin D, sunshine, magnesium. Okay, so there's a list that I repeatedly find, and there's only a list of five. You don't have to. We don't have to test. I think all you just named four. <laughs> yeah. Wait. What was the other one then? Uh, zinc. Zinc. The balance of zinc with copper as well, which is what I teach. So, I found that in my life as a GP, as well as a functional medicine practitioner, is that I only needed to look into these and create such change. Seventy percent of people that came through my clinic didn't have to come back again because they would just fix these and they'd know what to do. The body would know what to do. The body would just heal from the things that they kind of like circled and listed as symptoms and they'd go away. And then it's the 30% that I would go deeper into functional medicine work or integrative medicine work with them, with the gut issues, autoimmunity um, and more of the longstanding issues. But, you know, the everyday person, if you fix these, body heals itself, you know? Yeah, I love that, the five key nutrients approach because I do think there's an an element of you know in medicine there's so many, it's so complicated right the approach has to be complicated to be successful mm-hmm. but what you're saying is as long as you take care of these or as long as you look at these five key nutrients first mm. it's a 70% chance that you may be successful you may feel better yes. and i think that gives a glimmer of hope to women who are like this is too complicated an approach for me this is my starting point with all my patients and i found that it really gave them a lot of energy boost and a lot of um, calm and they stuck with any further work that they needed to do because by the time you come and seek help from a doctor or a practitioner you're tired you are like losing focus your brain fogged you know and so for um, some of my clients they come find me as a first step great but many people have cycled through doctors and specialists and practitioners and whatever else um, Having not even had these tests done or having had the tests done because the doctor obliged, but not having them looked at in an optimal range, or maybe they have looked at it in an optimal range, but haven't supplemented efficiently or long enough or with the right dose. And lastly, haven't been told how you're going to come off these supplements by tweaking your diet and your lifestyle. So there are all these steps missing, and I'm like, what's going on here? So it's not just about testing. I couldn't just tell my colleagues and my doctor colleagues, hey, just test for these, and then it'll all be good. Like, it'll, it'll, it'll get you one step, but there are five steps, right? To how to really create vibrancy, which is not being on supplements, not needing the ashwagandha and the rhodiola, and even the multivitamins, I dare say, right, to function, Right? Because you're optimally, your body is welcoming food into your body. Your body's digesting everything really well. You don't have to eat so much of everything. You, you have all the nutrients you need, right? And all the macros and the micros. So, so that is what I actually decided. Listen, if I'm taking through all my patients on this, how can I turn this into a course? Uh, doctors were not listening too much to me. Um, they were busy enough doing the um, busy work. And I was like, all right, well, let me see how much people want to know. And seriously, moms, coaches, like a whole host of them were like, oh, my God, can you teach us, please? You know, um, and so it I launched it at uh, in 2020 when everyone suddenly was online and everyone suddenly wanted to learn about how to improve your health and therefore your immunity improving. And so I called it Kickstart Your Immunity. And within Kickstart Your Immunity... We go through all these steps of what tests to request for with your doctor, any doctor. They're not functional medicine expensive tests, right? They're regular doctory tests that <laughs> labs know how to do very cheaply. Yes. It's just doctors don't ask for them enough. How to read them. Here's a cheat sheet. Read them and then follow the instructions of what to do depending on the reading that comes back. Here are the list of supplements that you want to choose from. Here's how much to take. Here are the ones that are great 
forms of supplements. Mm, you know, this is the kind of magnesium to take. Right. Take glycinate, for example, or citrate, and don't take magnesium oxide, for example, because none of that's really going to get into your body. So that education around that makes us savvy consumers, and we take the responsibility into our own hands to be super healthy so that we don't have to keep seeking the medical profession for for help. And, and frankly, will the medical profession tell you what to eat and how to care for your body? No, it's like, come to me when you're almost dying and I'll help you. Yeah, so right? I can give you this sponsored medication that I'm making a grip of cash off of. Uh, and I, and again, I, say that as, <laughs> I say that as someone who, you know, co-owns a clinic and is in the medical profession, you know, uh, my husband's in the medical profession. So, you know, I, I know the game. Yeah, it's it's like that, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, and it serves a purpose. Don't get me wrong. Like, I really do require that my clients who are coaching with me, I'm like, hey, I'm going to give you high level stuff. You need to do your GP stuff. You need to go and get a friendly GP. And the thing is, most GPs are beginning to realize that they're not the authoritarian, like authoritarian GPing and, and doctoring is not going to get you anywhere these days. I mean, people are empowered, yeah. which is awesome. Yeah. 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 Correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I understand, most people are deficient in magnesium. And it's not, well, I guess it could be that they're not eating enough. Correct. But is it also because it's just not being absorbed because of the nutrients they are taking in? So, again, correct me again if I'm wrong, but is it, you know, if you eat too many grains, it blocks the absorption of the magnesium in the body? Oh, yeah. There is that talk about how grains can be nutrient blockers. But I think that the effect of it is minute. Okay. Compared with magnesium washing out in our pee when we drink coffee, mm-hmm. when we're stressed, stressed people just contain more magnesium in their pee versus their bodies. Oh, please don't tell me I have to stop drinking coffee because I love coffee. <laughs> well, well, you can Ooh. take magnesium, right? That's yeah. fair enough. <laughs> that's that's a supplement I may need it. to continue then <laughs> in yeah, terms of not can, giving up caffeine. You can make yeah, a shameless plug. I yeah. mean, I, I, I founded the Sleep Lab to formulate pure 100% magnesium glycinate and pharmaceutical grade and I also make sure that they're fine ground because sickest patients kind of need to open the capsule and use them children can open the capsule and use them um, and they absorb super quickly without all the additives and the preservatives like that's a good one for us over 40 to keep as a daily habit because you take it one night you feel like your muscle tension goes away and I feel like you can catch the sleepy bug a bit quicker, right? You stay asleep and you're refreshed a little bit better, but you take it over months, you increase your bone density. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And your hormonal health and your detoxification abilities. Like I said about the soil, magnesium is so basic and how can most of us be lacking it? It's, it's, um, it's ludicrous. It's part of the, you know, the you mentioned the soil. So if someone went out into some grounding and actually went out without shoes on, can that help or not as much as, you know, I'm hoping? <laughs> yeah, a grounding is so good. I mean, that's how we reconnect with ourselves and reduce our inflammation levels. And we then don't rinse through our supplements as quickly when you are more connected with nature, when you're more connected with yourself and you're just living a little bit more calmly, authentically. You're not going to rinse through, for example, the magnesium as quickly. You're not going to rinse through your iron as quickly. Yeah, so in that way, it helps. But if you're deeply deficient, like most people are, then it requires that testing and that supplementing. Some people skip the testing because they have an idea and then they go out to the pharmacy uh, to, like, Guardian Pharmacy or the, you know, the retail shops to pick up a supplement and whatnot. Yeah, but you don't really know what you're treating yeah. by that point. Yeah, so. Yeah, um, what's your dosing? What's your frequency? Correct, but grounding yeah. is a great tool, like going for a swim in the sea, just like cures all my problems almost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other than the looks you get from people like, who's that crazy one walking around with no shoes on? Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> we should, should make that a norm, yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you mentioned earlier when we were talking about burnout, right? A lot of the burnout coming from work stress, right? Mm. From career pressures, from school pressures. But I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about one of the pressures that I think is increasingly facing women that are trying to conceive at older ages, and that's fertility pressure. And that is the pressure that we put on ourselves to have a baby. And the reality is it is harder to have a baby later in life. And those fertility pressures tend to feel more urgent when you're approaching 40 and 
you're thinking about fertility for the first time or you're thinking about even secondary infertility, right? So how do you work with women that are experiencing kind of a self-imposed level of stress from their fertility journeys? Oh, it's a big question, isn't it? Mm. I mean, that is a tough place to be, definitely. Um, and and actually, it, I find that it's a result of being, high, you know, maybe disconnected to the fact that actually in in um, older, third, more third world countries, people are having babies a lot earlier and then looking at career. Um, but a societal setup is just like, do your career, uh, do get your degree. And you can't just get your degree. You've got to get somewhere because there's always an internship and there's always something to achieve and something to achieve. And you put it off and you forget about your biology and you forget about your true needs and you put it aside. And then you wake up to your true needs and it's like, hey, time's passed. That's a hard pill to swallow. Yeah, you can't get time back. You cannot. Especially when it refers to your fertility. So it feels very unfair to the woman because she's suddenly like, what? You know? But what's happened is that perhaps, you know, it could be like, oh, have I lost my connection with myself for a while? And now I look at it and it's too late. That's really, really hard. But having said that, if we've been taking care of ourselves and we know how to take care of ourselves, literally, it can be the best time. And it's not a absolute 100 percent no. OK, good. You know? I like to hear that as an older mom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not a, a, you just a no. need to be real wise mm. about it, but also not to be harsh on yourself about it. And that's why I mentioned about the society and the conditioning and the stuff that we're trying to unpick about. Um, it's not an individual problem. And, and, and I don't want the individual to have to shoulder it quite. Um, because I do in the consultation room really see like really the woman has just taken it on and never ever spoken about it to anybody else and felt shame about it I'm like this is not your fault yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. but you got to be real smart about it yeah absolutely I had a client um, who I was speaking to um, who's struggling with a lot of issues. I'm pretty sure she's got high uh, cortisol levels. And um, at one point I mentioned to her, what about seeing a functional doctor? Because, you know, then we can sort of get to the sort of root cause of everything. And um, her response was, I went to go see a functional doctor, but the form was super long. She wanted to know, you know, how I was born, whether I was breastfed. breastfed. Mm. And she's like, I just don't have time for that. What would you say to somebody who feels like the functional know, approach, the is, functional too approach is just too much? Yeah. Functional medicine um, is a term that we have all been familiar with only in the last five years, yeah? Because the Institute of Functional Medicine um, have marketed it well, which is really awesome. Because before that, I was like, what do I even call this stuff? You know, integrative, holistic. My mentors who have been doing it since the 60s are have, have also gone through like several names for it, you know? Um, Ecological medicine is one of them, integral medicine, you know, a lot of stuff, right? Anyways, so functional medicine, as it's now called, has a particular method and is just one of my tools in a bunch of things that that I use. And one of the things that kind of when your question came up to me that made me kind of think, hey, actually functional medicine also has this bad rep of like big intake forms Big bunch of blood tests, two thousand dollars worth of blood testing. Yeah. I want to know. I want to know what your hormones are doing, and you're gonna go a Dutch test, and you're gonna do the whole host of uh, food intolerance tests, and this test, that test before I even see you. Yeah. That's a business too, right? I mean, we're complaining about the medical industry and how they run their business. This kind of way is it really needed? Um, so that's how some people run it, and therefore that's how functional medicine also has a bad reputation for being expensive, very expensive. But, you know, doctors, I believe, can learn some skills in functional medicine and really apply it with pragmatism um, very well. And yeah. it need not be expensive, and it need not. And then when you come to coaching, yeah. oh yeah, I mean <laughs> that's where like you know I coach so that we don't have to run the functional medicine tests. I coach I like so that. that we have them, but I can pull on them as needed. But I don't have to buy the most 
recommend the most expensive supplements to you. We have a chat about it, and I'm like, these are available to you, but do you really want to be using them as a crutch all the time, or do you want to finally look at your sleep, enhance that, and see again how much you need to spend? Yeah, I love it. I love that you empower your clients to make choices about how far they want to go into that supplement world, how far they want to go into functional medicine, right? Yeah. That lifestyle approaches can still, still. in many ways, be the solution. Oh, yeah. For reals. Yeah. Um, for real <laughs> reals. For real reals. <laughs> for reals. <laughs> All right, Gal. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. we are wrapping up here, but I thank you so much for your insight, Cheryl. I have one last question for you that we've been asking all of our guests here on the 40s formula, and it is... What is your 40s formula? If you had a few choice pieces of information to share with women in their 40s about how they can thrive and feel their best, what would that look like? It definitely is not buying into the decline because women have phases of life. We're cyclical. We're like, got, we've got seasons, right? We've got the growing up season. We've got the um, mothering season. And then we've also got the wise woman season at the end you know and it's a different one we d- we contribute to society we're going to contribute to society differently but that requires a maturation and that requires a new set of skills sometimes right um and I'm not there yet. I'm right at the beginning. So I'm actually considering that 40 is not an aging process. It's the it's the beginning of the next phase. It's like a rebirth. Mm. I love that. Yeah, I like that too. You know, it's the beginning of a new chapter. Mm. Right. Try again. <laughs> <laughs> We're still young enough to yeah. try. Try, try again. <laughs> yeah, let's do this again. And it's going to be really different. And it's going to really break us apart to rebuild, right? But I'm here to help. Like, you know, there's so much help around these days about and and a lot of people are also being a little bit more proactive with their. I love it. I'm meeting so many people who are doing this right and um, kind of catching themselves also prior to 40. I've got I'm working with people who are 35 who are so hyper aware of what's coming up, you know, Um, but never too late to start. And of course, um, with me, I like to be efficient. I'm a bit lazy. I just like to. I'm lazy. Like I'm just like laziness is a good thing because yeah. it's caused me to be so efficient yeah. with like how I spend my time. You know, I want to do the twenty percent and get eighty percent of the results. There What's the thing I'm gonna do? And that's kind of um, um, the base of how I think and how I plan the strategy for for people and my clients. And I I, I put out courses in that manner as well. Less yeah. time, more results. We are all about it. <laughs> all about that, Thank you so much again, Thank Dr. You. Cheryl, for being with us. We are so, so happy to have your insights and have you here with us on the 40s Formula. Thank you. I'm so grateful that you invited me. Thank you. This is Paul, our editor. He's a 25-year-old unmarried Singaporean guy listening to the ramblings of 12 older women on everything from menopause to weightlifting to sex. So, Paul, what's your thoughts on today's conversation? So I'm actually a composer, arranger, and I handle mostly post-production work on media-based stuff and on different mediums such as this podcast, I guess. Um, I grew up in a fast-paced environment here in Singapore with all the high-achieving lifestyle stuff, I guess. So, you know, I'm easily burned out with all the nature of my work and demanding deadlines. And besides that, I'm always constantly worrying about the stress, you know, of I guess primarily getting paid because I'm a broke mid twenties fresh grad with, you know, doing freelance work. Not saying that I'm broke exactly, but just saying that hey, money's always a thing because it's just the nature of the the job and the work. I guess so. In a way, I you know the topic of burnout relates to me pretty closely, and I don't really have a fixed way of handling burnout. But I guess for me, I drink alcohol. I guess because hey, man, I'm just twenties chilling. <laughs> All right. Anyway, not health advice, but just. Be healthy, I guess. All right, stay safe. See you guys. Bye-bye. Chill. Hey, guys, did you know that you can leave us questions and comments on FanList? That's right. On FanList.com slash the 40s formula, you can leave us a voice note where you can ask us anything, leave us your feedback, or just say hi. A listener also reached out to us and said this. Well done. I can't wait for the next one. I feel like I need more now. I need to binge listen to more. You got me hooked. I'm addicted. And I will definitely be forwarding this on to my friends and family. Thank you. Thank you so much, listener. It's so lovely to hear that you really enjoyed this. And thanks so much for forwarding this on to people who you feel can appreciate the content too. Before we go, please remember to hit subscribe and take a moment to support the 40s formula by leaving a review on your favorite podcast platform. 
Your reviews will help us to reach more people and allow us to continue to bring valuable content. It should only take a moment and is a free way for you to support the show. You can also stay updated with The 40s Formula by following us on Instagram at The 40s Formula, all one word. We share behind the scenes insights, episode updates, and much more. So please be sure to hit that follow button. As always, we appreciate your time and support this season. Thank you for being part of our community. And we'll be back next season for more empowering conversations with inspiring guests. Bye. Bye. Yeah, exactly. All the good the stuff studio. is Paul's. You guys. Yeah. Oh, you guys found him. Oh. Yeah. Well, I mean, hello, I'm Paul. The studio yeah. the studio actually did help us find Paul. Oh, was it, yeah, was it, it these guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So. Right? Yeah. yeah was, but, it, was it the high fab? Or was it someone else? I think. I can't remember. Somebody was, recommended was, you. Uh, Siobhan, right? Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There we go. So somebody recommended What's like that? your you know, What's your my job, job? Yeah. Usually, okay, so I am actually a full time freelancer. Um, my primary domain is actually in composition, like music and stuff. I'm a musician, ah. and um, and I and this is a bit more of like a side thing actually, like podcasting or recording for podcasting and post production because I have recording um, software experience, so I and experience. Give it a go as well. Yeah, 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 yeah totally. Yeah. And he oh. wrote our podcast jingle. Yeah. So when you hear the '40s formula jingle, that's all, Paul. Yep. <laughs> <gasps> really? Yeah. Okay. Wow, you guys are like, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> You're doing this properly. Yeah, yeah let's this see this another one properly. Because like, someone else made that comment to me. I'm just and like, oh, it's proper. I'm like, yeah, we're yeah, doing yeah, it yeah. proper. Yeah, no, no, no. Because like, I, we have, we, I look for jingles too. And we like kind of do a royalty-free music. Yeah. yeah. Like that. There's also royalty-free music. There is, ton yeah. of it, right? Or you can make a jingle, you know. Yeah. Well, we thought we'd utilize uh, Paul's skills. Yeah. And, uh, Which we didn't even know until okay, our first listen, conversation listen. with Paul. Yeah. I want a personal jingle. Yeah. Whenever I walk into the room, I want one like. Just like, um, okay, cool. There or yeah. Music. Yeah. That can be like your side side gig. Yeah. It's like yeah. podcasting and then also music for podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Double side gig. All right, cool.